road. Looking back, it's almost funny. He asked me, who were you just dreaming of? And I merely stared at him, looking incredibly asinine. Not that it mattered who I was dreaming of, because he'd still smash his lips against mine. His question wasn't going to change anything, only delay the process a few seconds. I'm thinking of my life back home, and I picture myself, except it can't really be me, because you can't be the same person in two separate places at the same time. And at my house, a little girl swings out back on a swing set. Her head arches back. The breeze blows through her hair. And I'm hoping that she'll remember this. The image is bright pastel pink. And it's the kind of thing you wish you could somehow save for your best friend, if ever you find one. Now I think I only really wanted one thing. I wanted someone to tell me, in a way that no one ever has or could, that they loved me. And it's not a question of strength, but want. I never wanted anything I didn't eventually receive until now, so I know I must not have wanted the other things. Because the second the whatever, whoever is in your hands, or between your sheets, or hanging in your closet, it's no longer a want. But my possessions are all I have left. The only definition of my persona, as far as I'm concerned most days. So I tossed out my simplicity for ever-so-helpful salesgirls and carefully arranged garnishes. With all of its safety, and still very much like what I expect more would be, a constant fight. I have this dream where I'm running, outwitting soldiers, kneeling, covering my head, keeping low and praying, and the shooting never stops. I want so badly to be hit, to scream in pain for one long moment, to drop dead and finally rest. But my wishes never come true. I stay in that dream, sliding through mosaic caverns that look like subway stations, waiting with other people, and a soldier pulls me to the middle to make me an example, and I don't even mind, because there's nothing I hate more than being ignored. But it hasn't been all that bad. I'm starting to see some things clearly. Enough time has passed. When it's happening, while each little bit unfolds, you can't recognize the tiny gestures, the minuscule things that will cause the outcome of the situation. But you can't see the big part, the grand scheme either. Because while you're in it, it blinds you. An overwhelming white gold haze clouds any rationale. The things that could armor you. Then, after it's over, memory fails, probably a defense mechanism. And no matter how many nights you spend on a pathetic bedroom floor smoking, no matter how many depressing songs you listen to, no matter how many dramatic poems you write, you can't remember. But one day, little by little, it seeps back into everyday life, and you recall specific dates, specific moments, even more clearly than when you lived them. Like when I waited for him at an airport in Kentucky, brand spanking new, sterile and blue. I waited for his face to come rushing toward me, but he never came. And no matter how hard I tried, he never came. So, back in Manhattan, I bought an outrageously expensive pair of red shoes to make me feel better and wore them every day until they literally disintegrated on my feet. 
He eventually found me again, and those infamous shoes now live on paper, trapped in one of the poems he wrote about me when I no longer fascinated him. The idea of me, my persona, still fascinated him, but me and the flesh didn't interest him. So he used, probably still uses, my personality whenever he likes. And I think that's the most despicable way to use another person. I mean, what defense is there? None. So I ran away the second I read the poem, though I only made it to the Motel 6 outside Harrisburg. That afternoon, when I ran away, no one tried to stop me. I packed a wicker basket full of supplies and drove through the country, listening to I Cried For You, sung in southern drawl. When I crossed the border into Pennsylvania, a big billboard taunted, America starts here. And I thought, well, I started here, and everyone knows that God blesses America, so I guess I'm blessed. Anyway, the man behind the counter at the motel was really greasy and offered to carry my basket to my room. And I said, just give me the key. And I hear him shrieking with laughter. And I ran to my room and then ran out of there in the morning back to Manhattan. So I do a lot of running, but I did try to make everything work. I tried and tried, but trying isn't good enough sometimes. Still, it's very important to keep promises, especially promises you make to yourself. I keep plugging down my line, the endless road, and I can't even call anyone because phone calls only make me feel like I'm sucking for words from a box with a voice. And even if I could, there's no one to call, no one who could help this kind of pain. When you start to cry about one thing but realize you're crying about something totally different, it's confusing and scary. So I'm here in this car, and when I get there, I'll sit in a tub of scalding hot water, scrub myself with peach kernel soap, and I will cry. Today I do feel different and very old. I wish I wasn't growing up, and I wish it wasn't happening so fast and far away from home. I'll cry about my father and about my hometown and about loving this one and not loving that one. And I'm thinking, what comes around goes around. And there's too much work to do, too many words to write. On nights like tonight, I wish someone was here, sitting watching me, curling next to me in a huge bed. And I wonder how long it really takes to know someone, how many beers it takes, how many kisses. But God, right now, I just want to pee. I only want to sit and pee.